Two cracking yarns for you tonight. I hope we'll put a smile on your face. If you woke up in the regional New South Wales town of Tumut this morning, the temperature gauge would have read two degrees in the Riverina. You'd have drawn the curtains. You'd see a heavy fog across the snowy mountains. Home to just 6,000 people. It's a wonderful part of the world. And it's home to the Tumut Broom Factory. Now, the last original millet broom factory in Australia, straw brooms, as they're known, handmade millet brooms have been made at the factory the same way since 1946. Now, if you'd stuck your head in this morning, you'd have seen Jeff Wurtz and Rob Riches toiling away. Rob's on the line from Tumut at the foot of the Snowy Mountains. Rob, how are you? Where are yeah, you? Good, Alan, yourself. <laughs> It'll be pretty chilly tonight, is it? Do I want to get the fire going? Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, this time of year, it's mostly chilly every night. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go back to the early days. You began in 1946 as the Tumut Rural Cooperative Millet Society. Who started the company? The local farmers around Tumut, they um, used to grow millet um, prior to the broom factory starting, and uh, they'd send the millet off to Sydney where it'd be auctioned off, because at one stage there used to be up to 14 broom factories in Australia. And um, they'd send it to Sydney where it'd be auctioned off and sold over broom factories, and they thought, well, instead of just growing millet and selling millet, let's form the cop and make brooms as well. And that's how the Tumut Rural Cooperative started. But, but I understand there were 20, well, am I right? 20 broom makers in the 60s when millet production was at its peak in the Tumut was... district. Is that right? Oh, I don't know if there was 20 broom makers. There was, there was an awful lot of growers of millet. Growing millet. The, mm. broom, the broom factory itself, we're not, like I'd worked there in 73, um, I started the broom factory. And back then there was um, at least four broom makers there making brooms. Then you had other people employed in the factory. There were probably on. a dozen ha people working there. Hang on. How do you... This business of hand-making a broom, yep. how do you do that? Is that a difficult skill to master? Well, yeah, it takes a fair while to learn. Uh, a broom, you have a machine that's called a broom winder and all it does is turn the handle for you. And um, you have to make a broom with different layers to build the quantity of millet up you need on the handle. Have a look at that. And uh, there's, there's what we call guts layers, inside hill, turn back and outside layers. That's, so, um, as you see there, that's me there making a broom there. So you sew and, the broom, uh, sew the broom. I mean, it's got to be tough on your hands. Yeah, you, they're starting to get a bit of rough riders these days, but, um, yeah, just keep going. Has it, changed? Um, like has, it, has it changed much over the 70 years the factory's been operating? The broom's still made the same way, but as you see there on that picture there, there's a shaft there, whereas the old days there used to be four machines below that shaft, like a shearing shed set up, and they were wooden machines. But now we have two independent machines that do the same thing. They just turn the handle for you. So is, is the it... broom's actually made still the same way. So they're just you and Jeff. But... You and Jeff. Yep. Eh? You started there as young blokes. And now it's just the two well, of you doing it all? Yeah, well, like, they used to, like I said, when I first worked there, there were 14 people. Um, I only worked there for a few years first up. Um, back then, we used, probably used to do at least 400 brooms a day. 400 and, brooms um, a day. And what people... Day, yeah. People come along as a uh, tourist attraction, isn't it? I mean, don't people come and have a look at you? Where do you get the millet yeah. from? Well, nowadays, we, we can't get any local millet. Oh. In its heyday around Chubert, they, they grew up to about 800 tonne a year, which is about probably around 1,600 acres are worth of millet. It was a millet grows like corn. And it grows anything from 7 foot to 7, 14 foot tall. So it's got to be all hand harvested. And that's why nowadays people, farmers won't grow it anymore because they can't get one to cut it. And, Years and, ago, people were willing to do that job, but nowadays people, people won't do that sort of work, so we've got to import it from Mexico. I mean, are we... Uh, yeah, but, I mean, are we still using the straw broom? Yeah, yeah, we have good demand still. Like, it keeps us busy all the time. At the moment, I'm teaching Jeff's son, Andrew, how to uh, make a broom. <laughs> and my son, Bradley, is going to move back to Tumut um, shortly down the track. And uh, he's going to be interested in learning how to make a broom too. So hopefully the, the uh, trade will keep going. Good there is another... Good there way. is a couple other people in Australia still making brooms. There's Peter Sturdy out the road. That Fantastic. He, does a, he gets a person on the weekend and makes him a few brooms that he sells at... Um, uh, market are. gardens and a few things, and there there's are. an old chap at Morford, but, but we're the original 
factory still going. There you are. Well, there you are. That's what I call a good news story. Rob, thank you for your time. One of the broom makers at the Tumut Broom Factory. Now, you'll find their brooms at your local hardware store, but just to make sure where you can find them and to order online, just go to tumutbroomfactory.com. And to my viewers, think about the changing nature of manufacturing in this country. Broom millet was grown by about 120 families in the Tumut area from the 1920s onwards, and these families produced 75% of Australia's millet. Approximately 1,200 tonnes of millet were harvested when it was at its peak. Now, all these years later, millet is grown on only three farms in the area, producing about eight tonnes each season. It's the same story you heard Ron say, they've got to import the stuff. It's the same with milk and beef and lamb and pork and wool, you name it. If we don't make a conscious effort to buy Australian made, I think we're in strife. Anyway, the Tumut... Sorry, not the Tumut... Broomfactory.com. Well, now, from brooms to birds, this is amazing. Australia's had a long love affair with big things, haven't we? The big pineapple on the Sunshine Coast, the big merino in Goulburn, the big prawn in Ballina, there's even a big bogan in Ningen. My next guest is an artist from Townsville in far north Queensland. He was stranded in Brisbane during COVID and the lockdown and decided to think big. This is a hell of a story. I'll bring him in here. Father Dean Deliri. How are you? Hi, Joe. Not too bad, mate. How are you, Alan? I'm well. You're in Toowoomba, <laughs> I think. You've got an incredible, right now, yeah. incredible story to tell, and we'll come to that in a <clears> moment. <throat> but tell us about your giant kookaburra. Yeah, the giant kookaburra is pretty big. It's about four metres high, but 11 metres from the tail to beak, and it travels. It's a well-incorporated engineer into a trailer, and apparently it has literally a tail light. <laughs> <laughs> this is a four metre tall bird, which isn't a bird, and it laughs, doesn't it, like the real kookaburra? Now, look, we've, got oh, some, yeah. we've got some footage here. Have a look at this. We've got some footage here. <laughs> Now, look, oh, my God, you didn't build it for fun, though. There's a special message, isn't there, that you want to share? Yeah, the message is that we need to laugh at times. You know, when there are things going tough with the COVID-19, the economic uh, uh, problems and all, sometimes, basically, we need to have that bit of a break. And this kookaburra, when it passes through people and people are walking around, some very grimful faces. As soon as this kookaburra comes, they turn and look at it. They go right in full laughter. <laughs> the cameras come up. But you're touring all over Queens. You're touring all over Queensland, yeah. aren't you? Look at the damn thing. Yes. The kookaburra. Yeah. Hey? And yeah. now that Pride of Places mascot of the Townsville Cultural Festival, which, uh, which you founded, I know. Look, this is a better story than that. You were born in a religious minority... I'll just tell my viewers this in Iran. Have a look at this fellow. Yeah. As a young boy experienced what he said was the true face of human rights abuse. You follow the Baha'i faith and yeah. basically you were born in Persia, grew up in Tehran and you served time yeah. in prison. And then you had to flee <laughs> to India and it was yeah. in India that you studied <clears throat> fine arts. Now, you've got a PhD. Yes, yes. Where did you get that? <laughs> That's from uh, James Cook University in Townsville. Mate. Yeah, that's in the education. So you actually eventually, you were stateless there for a while, weren't you? And you eventually, with your family, headed to Tasmania as a refugee. Yes, yes, correct. <laughs> and I love Tasmania. <laughs> I love that place. I know. <laughs> it's fantastic. This man was homeless, tired, friendless, penniless, and he thought, well, bugger this, I'm going to study. So he studied for a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD... La Trobe University, <laughs> Monash University, James Cook, and then with the PhD settled in Townsville. So now you've made the big bird, eh? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I hope you don't come yeah. around my place at about 4 o'clock in the morning and wake us all up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I tell you, the kookaburras around my place, sometimes they start singing since this thing has come around. <laughs> and my wife wakes me up in the morning and says, did you put this kookaburra on and again? I said, no, they're the real ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fa <laughs> Wonderful. well, now, fa let me tell you, Father Dean once wrote, to be able to smile in the face of emotionally challenging events and stay calm in moments of stress is an ability that everyone can learn. You've written a book, haven't you? I think I should not... <laughs> yes, I think yes. I should not think. Yes. Okay? Just finally, yeah, yeah. Just finally, tell our viewers what you think about the turmoil you've been through and how you've come to where you are today. Yeah, I think that 
you know, the life is full of lessons. If we treat every event as a learning opportunity rather than as a as something to be afraid from, then that learning opportunity becomes a stepping stone for going further. And yeah. that's my discovery. Wonderful. And whenever we hit hard the, the fear factor, if we stop and take a breath and look at the problem without emotional charges, then you. we can see more and then Good we can you. actually overcome. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And then particularly with Australian situation, okay. there are opportunities. And I, I think that if we try to use what we have, yep. we are truly the luckiest, not one of the, the luckiest country in the world. Beautiful. It's a great story, Father Dean. Congratulations <laughs> on the work you've done. Let's finish by hearing the kookaburra again. This is amazing. <laughs> Father Dean, thank you for that. 